Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Whoop Podcast, where we're on a mission to unlock human performance. I'm your host, Will Ahmed, founder and CEO of Whoop. This week's episode, Whoop VP of Performance Scientist, our principal scientist, the one and only Kristen Holmes, is joined by Army Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Jaster, a soldier, an engineer, a wife and mother, a trailblazer, one of only three women to graduate from the first integrated United States Army Ranger program, one of the most difficult combat training courses in the world. Lisa was the first female Army Reserve officer to become Ranger qualified. Lisa is also the author of Delete the Adjective, where she details her time in Ranger School and how there is no quitting. Kristen and Lisa will discuss the Army Ranger School. Lisa talks about why she signed up, the difficulty, and when she felt her most vulnerable. The power of shedding labels. Takeaways from Lisa's book, Delete the Adjective. How Lisa uses WHOOP. Developing a strong mentality, Lisa talks about how she pushes herself through disciplines like Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and Lisa's advice to young women on pursuing their passions. She says it's about going all in. Great message from Lisa Jaster. The holidays are coming up, and if you've got someone in your life who is obsessed with their health, fitness, tech, sleep, and always finding the ways to feel their best, Whoop makes the perfect gift. Check out whoop.com slash gifting to learn more. If you have a question you want to answer it on the podcast, email us, podcast at whoop.com. Call us, 508-443-4952. Without further ado, here are Kristen Holmes and Lisa Jaster. Lisa, your story of being one of the first three women to earn the coveted Rager tab is just absolutely incredible. You know, as I read your book, Delete the Adjective, A Soldier's Adventures in Rager School, I kept thinking about this concept of renewal. John Gardner, he's, uh, he's one of my favorite thinkers. Uh, he was the Secretary of Health, uh, Education, and Welfare under Lyndon Johnson. And in his writing, he explored this concept of tough-minded optimism and, and how the future is, is really shaped by people who actually believe in the future. <laughs> and like your book made me reflect on how frequently these qualities of renewal, vitality, optimism, you know, get just absolutely buried under the weight of tradition and history. And, you know, military and kind of hospital systems actually kind of came to mind immediately. And I and I think what people might not really appreciate is when we don't believe in our future, you know, vitality diminishes. And I think the second order effect of that is the, the you know, flexibility gives way to rigidity and creativity fades. And there's this loss of capacity to meet challenges from unexpected directions, which is obviously pretty important to be able to do in a military setting. <laughs> so I think like renewal at an institutional level can only really happen when there are individuals who are willing to take risks. And I'd love, you took the ultimate risk, really. And I, I'd love to to start there. You know, did you feel like this was a risk? And I just would love to, yeah, just get your get your thoughts on how it all started and 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 in the context of, of risk. You know, Kristen, thinking about it from an angle of risk is very different. Not a not a way I've looked at it previously, mostly because I think one of the reasons why I was able to succeed, 19 women started, three of us graduated. And I think one of the reasons I was able to succeed is because what was my greatest risk? I had a great full-time job. I already had a pretty solid military career. I had a super supportive husband, have, not past tense. I have a super supportive husband. I have two good kids that, you know, love me and, and support me. So looking at it from a risk standpoint is interesting because I think sometimes being 37, when the typical graduate was 23, 24, I technically was risking more, but I had already risked more in the past. And I'd seen what taking the leap does, what positive impact you can have if you put yourself out there. And I had the the privilege of qualifying for the fittest games. It's a, a Texas-based CrossFit competition back in 2019. It was after Ranger School. 
And no, it was, uh, I'm sorry, 2016. And I qualified for it. And then the competition was 2017, very early in the year. And one of the games level competitors that was in my age group kind of made fun of me because there was a, a workout that included a weight I had never picked up off the ground before. And she did it like 15 times. And I did it three times. You know, my body basically imploded underneath me. It just it was, it was awesome. And I'm crying with joy. And she's sitting there saying, Hey, the coolest thing I just saw is that you had no problem embarrassing yourself. Cause we're in a stadium, you know, there's people 360 degrees. My husband looks over at me. He's like, I'm not sure that's a compliment. And you know, she's, we're holding each other. And it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like what does risking it all in front of people right here and now bring to tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And my daughter at one point in time has quoted that incident back to me, you know, and you, you think about that little micro story versus six months at ranger school, you know, there is definitely risk leading towards a better future, a more integrated future, more talent being accessible to the military, to even, you know, different environments because the discussion doesn't stop with the military. Now the discussion moves into law enforcement and first responders and, and where can we start pushing these physical boundaries? If we stop, if we stop bucketing people. Hmm. I heard a conversation with, uh, with, I, I forget which podcast it was on. Maybe the Jedbird podcast, I think with Fran. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. It was an awesome conversation. To just like listen to you guys go back and forth. Um, two peas in a pod. Uh, <laughs> Brand. But what he, he mentioned that, you know, there, you know, not long ago, you know, a, a high ranking military official was very adamant about women not being a part of our Army Ranger school. Right. And he was very, very adamant uh, about that. That was not going to happen under his watch. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what changed and just your experience and I guess, enrolling in, in ranger school, like, but maybe just talk a, a little bit about what kind of shifted, I suppose. And what was that process like to actually, you know, kind of sign up and, you know, make that first step, I guess. Yeah. The chief of the army reserve in 27 or 2015, when I graduated actually asked me, he said, you know, Lisa, why do you think you're the first reservist female to have graduated from ranger school? in 2015. And I, I don't know, sir, I, I knew it was a leading question and he's a sir. So I just kind of sat back and said, I don't know, sir, you know, teach me. And his response was because nobody was allowed to try in 2014, 2013, 2012, exactly your, your point. And mm -hmm. what changed, I think is I give a lot of credit to those women out there who were doing combative activities, whether you're talking about MMA, one of one of the people I really look up to, and I don't know her as a person, I don't know anything about her personality, but think of what Ronda Rousey did for the combatives world. I mean, how amazing. First female in the UFC Hall of Fame. I mean, she broke boundaries. Women and the way they have performed in the Olympics. It used to be the women's sports were the gymnastics and the really, really, really physical, but not necessarily something a lot of men are doing. Now the women are starting to do well in wrestling. We had our first uh, mm -hmm. U.S. female win the gold in wrestling a few years back. And then to look at CrossFit, CrossFit has been huge. Um, I no longer do CrossFit. I do HIIT training. Mm -hmm. But look at what CrossFit has done with how people envision women. Bodybuilding and all of those physique type competitions had existed for a long time. But even those women would say, I'm looking to, to build an aesthetic. I'm not building functional fitness. And now you have uh, reels being made, quoting Joe Rogan about, I want a woman who can move a couch. So what has happened is with social media and with the, the women who are out there doing it is we're finding that there's a lot of people who can't. And it's not a gender issue. It's, it's really people can. And when you see so many people out there being fit, posting reels, 
I actually love following the the whoop page because I love when people screenshot their workouts and I'm like, Ooh, mm-hmm. look what he did. And, and I'm, I'm on my bike trying to see, Ooh, I wonder if I can get that high on a bike. Mm-hmm. I know I can sprint. Yeah. And it's this culture of acceptability with regards to fitness and fitness had been the barrier in combat arms. Everybody just assumed mm-hmm. women couldn't. Well, you know, no woman could ever do a pull-up before she trained doing pull-ups. But now that you have women normalized doing pull-ups all the time, you see women doing those uh, kipping pull-ups and doing sets of 30. I did sets mm-hmm. of 30. In, and yeah. I'm, again, I'm 45. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's possible. And strict pull-ups and all of those other things come from that as well. And it just, to, to make a short story long and to answer your question, mm-hmm. Kristen, is we just needed to start seeing it. For us to believe it. I love that. Give us a, a little bit of a background in terms of just what actually is Army Ranger School and and what makes it so difficult. Yeah, so and so well respected, you know, because it's not just in the U.S., but it's it's respected worldwide as being you know the most rigorous school. So I think my favorite military. stats are: it's a nine week school. On average, if you're in the nine week school just for the nine weeks, you never recycle; you just go straight through. You walk over 200 miles carrying a pack that averages 60 plus pounds. Some days you're doing 90 plus. You sleep on average. Let me quote it correctly. The website says your average work day is 19 and a half hours. And that's for nine weeks. That's two and a half months, give or take. And that's that's the just mentally getting through that. There's a physical aspect to it, but you're eating two meals a day. Most of the time, those two meals are back to back. A lot of times you'll eat one meal at three o'clock and the next one at three 30, just because you get 30 minutes of sleep that night. And, and that's what happens. So you're looking at ingesting 2,400 calories, sleeping less than three hours on average. Cause if the workday is 19 and a half hours, we're still talking, we have to do showers. We have to change. We mm-hmm. have to actually get into the bed to sleep. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you think about all of those things put together and there's a extreme physical aspect to it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so respected is because they make us tired. They make us hungry. And then they say, Hey, I need you to lead troops through the woods through somewhere you've never walked before. There are no paths. There's no guidelines. There's no, there's no beacon at the end. These people are strangers. They're also tired and hungry. You have to get them to do what, what we want you to get them to do. And also you have to do combat operations at the same time. So you're firing blank rounds. You're having artillery simulators shot at you. And so they're making this high stress environment where it's extremely physical you're doing it for nine weeks and then, and then you're getting graded on your ability to lead people who are in that same deprived situation as you. And just to give an example of, it's about a 50%, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower graduation rate. A lot of people who graduate are graduate on their second or third attempt. But on my first day there, day zero, just shy of 400 people showed up shaved their heads, packed their two duffel bags, kissed their families goodbye, got in an airplane, went to Fort Benning, Georgia, um, now called Fort Moore, went to Fort Moore and and said, hey, I'm going to do this. And that was day zero. 25% of those people that did all that didn't make it to breakfast on the first day. What? So so that's... I mean, what happened between then and breakfast? Just change of mind? Like, just... So, you know, there's, there's paperwork. We lost one person due to improperly filled out paperwork. And then Mm -hmm. that first night you get a couple hours of sleep, you wake up, you don't have any food and you have to take a physical fitness test. And, and some people Mm -hmm. had just never done that. Now, as a mom of two, I had pulled lots of all nighters and had to perform the next morning. Like babies don't care that you have a full time job. (laughs) So I actually think being older and, and being a mom was an advantage. Let me, let me not yeah. kid you there, but it's, you build resilience oh, yeah. when you, oh, yeah, yeah you, as you a mom, there's no question. Yes. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> but that first day you do a physical fitness test called the, uh, RPA Ranger fitness assessment. Mm. And it's two minutes of push ups, two minutes of sit ups, five mile run under 40 minutes, and then six dead hang chin ups. 
none of those individually are difficult, but when you're high stressed, you're in a brand new location. People were flying in from all over the, all over the mm -hmm. nation, but even all over the world and taking this test, you know, the standards, but I mean, a push up where you're hitting your chest to the ground 49 times is not what most of us practice in the gym. We do mm -hmm. these little arm movement things. For and so to have somebody sitting there when you're in a sawdust pit, looking over your shoulder, making sure you're touching the ground each time, it's, it's a different, you're held to a different level and yeah, 25, about 25% didn't, didn't make it to breakfast that first day. And is that because they didn't pass the fitness test? Like, is it some combination? Okay. So just folks who literally could do 49 pushups on top of, yep. and there's a running component and a, a pull-up component and, uh, What's the fourth component? Pull-ups, chin-ups. Of the fitness test? Uh, chin-ups. Yeah, and, and, and I was really surprised with the five-mile run. You know, five miles under 40 minutes is hard, but it's not yeah. It's not, not doable for sure. a lot of people. But with the stress of everything going on and it's a route yeah. you don't really understand and you're not, yeah. you don't have your GPS and you're not, you're not watching your own pace, you just have to, you have to be trained well enough to know, okay, this is about an eight-minute split. And and a lot of people just just were passing out or puking right as they were hitting that finish line and and couldn't make it on to the next stage. That's wild. Like what you know, in during those nine weeks, I, I read your book, so I know I know some of this. But <laughs> um, for our listeners who might not have read your book yet, you know, just talk about when did you feel like you're most vulnerable? And, you know, kind of at what point during the program and did you actually ever consider quitting? Mm. So most vulnerable was in mountains. So there's three phases. Mm -hmm. You have your first phase and your second phase is mountains. There was three of us left in the program. There were three women remaining. Uh, Chris Greist and Shay Haver mm -hmm. moved on to the third and final phase. And I was held back in mountains to redo it. And up to this point, part of my, not all of my, but part of my motivation was to, to change people's minds about women, to show people that, because even if Chris and Shay did it, they were in their 20s. I'm in my 30s and not my early 30s. Like I'm 37 year old mother of two. I turned 38 two weeks after graduating. So I'm, I'm touching on 40. And, you know, I know, I know there's plenty of powerful women out there that can do this, but now the barrier was going to be broken by somebody other than me. So I had to dig deep and say, hey, do I still want to be here? Does it make sense? Like Chris and Shay are going to be the first women to graduate. What am I doing? I'm away from my home life. And because I wasn't active duty army, I was also away from my work life. So every day I was gone, I was, I was damaging. Not that I was working for Royal Dutch Shell, not that Shell would have negatively thought of me because I was serving the country, but it was a volunteer school. I wasn't progressing in my job for a while. My, my pay wasn't going real well because I was a reservist. So the army wasn't mm -hmm. paying me and shell was taking away money because I wasn't coming to work. And, mm -hmm. and so there's all these stresses on me. So I would say that's the most vulnerable time, but it, it was a quick transition Immediately following that, I went into line, made a phone call home to my husband and he, while I was in line, actually somebody asked a question and it was a really, it was a really simple question. He had, he had some rubbing spots from going commando and he wasn't sure he was going to be able to carry on because it's, it was in a painful location. And I gave him a piece of random advice that somebody without that appendage shouldn't have known. And he's like, how do you even know to do that? And I said, oh, it's just a mom thing. Like you just think of these kind of weird <laughs> solutions to weird problems right. as a parent. And, right. um, and he laughed and he actually was interviewed about that months later. And he talks about that story, which I think is, is hilarious. But it was that Amazing. moment where I went from, hey, should I even be here to wait a second here? That guy will always remember me. And next time mm -hmm. he's in a combat zone and somebody said something like, hey, women don't belong here, he's going to say, no, they can add value, whether it's that story, whether it's me doing as many pull-ups as him or anything else. So 
to answer the other question, did I ever think about quitting? I'd be lying if I said I never did, but I actually held a quote of Ronda Rousey's, of course, in my head nice. the whole time. And, and she had said in a TV show at one point in time, never let the quit in. Once you give quit mm -hmm. real estate in your brain and it's got its mm -hmm. foot in the door, it can always nuzzle its way in. So I fought really hard to never let quit have some real estate inside me. That's amazing. How do you feel like just understanding kind of the military, like how did the three of you graduating kind of renew the military, you know, and, you know, d did it, did it renew the, the military in, in, in a meaningful way from your, in your opinion? So I've been in the army. I was, I went to West Point cadet basic training in 1996, was commissioned in 2000. I have a five-year break in service. So I am very junior to my commission year peers. What that means is my, my peers who stayed in are all 06s. They have 23 years of service. I have 17 years of service, 17 and a half, and I'm an 05. So I'm one rank below most of my peers. Not that big of a deal, but I left the military. I left active duty for a reason. At one point in time, I, I felt like it wasn't for me anymore. I missed it and, and went back in, but graduating from ranger school gave me a voice. And so I had the honor of attending the President Obama's last State of the Union address as a guest of Michelle Obama. And during that process, I was pulled to the side by all of the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all the military leaders that were also at the same uh, State of the Union address. And I'm, I'm in the side room and I, I have a conversation with General Milley at the time, who was chief of staff of the army. And I said, sir, what can I give back to the army? Like your army's given me a lot, just to your point, it's very invigorating to, to accomplish something you never even thought you were going to be allowed to try. And to save you the long version, he ended up saying, I need you to be visible. I need you to be public. And, and that kind of it turned on a light bulb for me because he was showing me that I now had a voice and I could be influential and I could use it. I could stick my head in the sand like an ostrich and just ignore it. Or I could, I could be bitter. Like there's a, there was a lot of things I could mm. do now that I had this voice and there are things in the army that need to change. There are things in the military that need to change. There are things in society that needs to change. And I think now that I have a voice, if I can use it for a positive message, uh, specifically with regards to the military, because that obviously is an area that I know more than in other arenas, if I can use that, and in my case, I'm using it to say, Kristen, we're having this conversation. We met because I'm one of the first females to have graduated from Ranger School. I want to delete the adjective. I want it to never be a big deal when women break barriers because there are no more barriers to break. So I'm going to take my voice and, and my newfound passion, thanks to the military, and say delete the adjective because adjectives describe us. They do not define us. Yeah, and that's a great segue to talk a little bit more about your book. Like, you know, what was the first label or barrier you were able to shed during Ranger School? The visible one is being a female. We had to keep a quarter mm. inch of hair while all the guys had to shave their heads. So mm. no matter how much I lowered my voice, no matter how much I walked like one of the dudes, I always stuck out because not only that, but you can't tell now because again, I'm about to turn 46. My hair is getting a little bit not as red, but it was really bright red. So I have bright red mm. hair and everybody else has a shaved head. So obviously I stuck out as a female, but... Mm. As soon as we stuck with everybody on the five mile run, as soon as we you know, ran to the chow hall, did the same chin ups as everyone else, knew the same knowledge, the female thing kind of only was important to the general public. People not at ranger school cared about that. People within ranger school just care cared whether or not you could carry your own load. But being older and being a mom was a label that like, people just couldn't get past it because I, my classmates, <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. Like, I, you know, it's it just the sheer, like, holy shit, what? <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, my classmates I mean, were younger than my issued 
gear, like my duffel bag. I had had that duffel bag longer than some of them had been alive. And, and so to sit there and, and have these be my peers, I was the same age as some of their moms. Mm. And, and so they really couldn't get over the idea that mom or aunt Lisa is, is sitting right next to them, you know, cleaning a, a squad automatic weapon. It just <laughs> it's a little, little hard cognitive it's dissonance hard to process. There. Yeah, exactly. You know, you kind of have gone through this just seminal kind of experience and how do you, you know, what are some things that you take from that experience of going through ranger school that are kind of with you in everyday life? You know, are there, is there, you know, just kind of principles that you kind of carry around, like that you transfer to your kids and to your husband and to the people close to you and to the world? Like, you know, what are some kind of things that you just are like, wow, I learned this and this applies so directly to everything that I do every single day? Yeah. I think we all talk about communication and you can see graphics, you can see charts. People love talking about communication. The truth is when you are in a really stressed out situation with everybody was alphas. I mean, there were no betas, there were no omegas. Everybody was an alpha that I was around, but you know, some of them were 22. Some of them were from different backgrounds. Some of them were combat guys and some of them were mechanics and cooks. So uh, you did have a difference of personalities, but there was a huge age gap. And so one of the things I, I definitely learned with regards to communication is how you send the message matters. So speak to speaking to be heard is kind of the note that I've taken from Ranger School. It's, it's easy to be dictatorial, especially as somebody who was a field grade officer in the military. If I say something, people just do it. Sometimes if I say something, people have secondary and tertiary actions that I don't even want, but they automatically do it because I'm senior. They're like, oh, well, if Colonel Jaster said this, these are the other things we need to do. So I've learned that, hey, when I'm communicating to somebody who's generationally different from a different background, different city, different town, especially when they're degraded, when all of our EQ, like our our emotional intelligence drops significantly when you're sleep deprived. So you have to communicate in a way that they can really hear you without having to translate much. And so with my kids, my husband, and oh, I know he's going to listen to this, but my husband and my daughter <laughs> are so much alike and they're clashing and they will get mad at each other. And I can't say this to my, my awesome husband because you know he's 51 years old and he's the adult in the relationship. But I, I will look at my daughter and say, you need to listen to your dad with your dad ears on. So think about translating like old Star Trek type translation ears, but think about what he thinks he's communicating to you versus what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And then when you speak to him, don't make him translate and use his Tory ears. Let speak to him using your dad mouth. And so that's kind of the lesson that carries over. The other thing I really learned that I never thought of is having kids was something I married the man of my dreams and he really wanted to have kids and I was okay with that. But being separated from my family, I realized that for me, the next generation is my future and I want to invest in them more. And obviously it's in the in the aspect of my own children, but even in volunteering to coach cheerleading and right, because you go to ranger school and then you coach cheerleading totally makes sense. Mm. But <laughs> even in volunteering and being around other kids and, and the future, it's really important to, to take that time so that your legacy doesn't die. And so that you're not 60. And when you stop being, the person you thought you always were going to be because you're on the far end, you're heading towards retirement, you're still able to add value to society and community. So I think being a mom is more important to me because I went to ranger school, which is a odd lesson to learn. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I, I mean, just talking about like your legacy, you know, I, I, I have a daughter and, uh, you know, she's very committed to going into the military and, you know, just, I, I don't think you probably realize you know, the, the impact that you've had on this next generation, you know, to, to know that it's, it's possible, you know, to, you know, to compete 
at these elite schools that have been exclusively male for so long is uh, is really empowering and it just totally you know lifts the ceiling in, in a way that I think is um, is is so important for our society in in so many ways. So yeah, just I'm going to continually thank you. But um, in terms of just kind of wrapping the book, which I really hope folks read it because it's 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 so empowering and a beautiful. I think reframing of of how we think about kind of norms and labels in society and what is your kind of general hope for folks who read the book you know what do you what do you want them really to get out of it so so I'm going to back up a little bit to Kristen to yeah. to you talking about your daughter I think one of the hard things for me is going to ranger school is very visible it was on in people magazine and all the newspapers but yeah your first question, like, how did we get ready? How did it become okay to now integrate? And it was all the work that other people have put in. And so I want to go back to all those women who are in STEM, yourself included, and it's not as visible, but it is so impactful. It is so hard for my, you know, my daughter is uh, 11 years old and she's five foot nine. She's almost five foot nine. She's, she's huge. Right. (laughs) And I'm not, I'm not inspiring to her, but to see her grandmother who's six one, who played volleyball and is still playing tennis to see people who are, she always prefers to go to the female veterinarian. And it's not because it's, I'm not taking my kid to the veterinarian. I'm taking my cat to the veterinarian with my daughter, just just to clarify, I'm a little yeah. redneck, but not that bad. But, you know, just because she likes to see those people out there, you know, breaking through the barriers and, and making that change. So I, I got stuck on that and headed backwards. You had a different question for me that I didn't answer. No, no, I was just really, yeah, just, just wondering kind of what your hope is for folks who read the book. Like, what do you really want them to take away and, and carry forward? Yes, thank you. And I think... When the book came out, people thought this was a resilience book for women to be inspired. Mm. And if it is, that's fantastic. That is not my target audience. My target Mm. audience is, and because you've read it, you know, it's those guys in there that have never met a Kristen or a Lisa or a Chris Christ or a Shea Haver or Mm. somebody who wants to get their hands dirty. They want to get into the research, into the mud, into whatever it is that's non-stereotypically male or, you know, stereotypically male. They've never met somebody like that before. The book is an opportunity to introduce people who have absolutely fantastic women in their lives that aren't like us to someone like me. And, and, And that's the goal. So I hope that people pick it up and maybe they see a little bit of themselves in, in the book the response I've gotten from the military community has been pretty fantastic. I've had a few men who were either ranger instructors or were at ranger school read it and say, oh, wait a minute, I could tell that exact same story. You didn't, you didn't go through anything different than me. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. And he's like, well, that's cool. I, I, I'd work with you. And I'm like, that's the point. So that, that was really yeah. what I hope that people get from it. And if you get a little bit of inspiration, that's, that's great. But, um, hopefully, hopefully you don't focus on all the times that I curse. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's just part of the territory and those people just need to get over it. <laughs> Lisa, when I, when I met you, uh, I, gosh, it was a couple of years ago now. Yeah. Or, or last, last like year, a, a, around this yeah. time last year, yeah. I remember when I when I first saw you, I was like, "Oh my gosh, Lisa Jastrow's wearing a whoop!" <laughs> <laughs> I remember reaching out to like my team, like, "Geez, how's a whoop on?" I, just um, and I thought it was. I know, I know. I just thought it was like the coolest thing. I'm like, this is like the tip of the spear in terms of like badass humans, and she's like, "Of course, he's wearing a whoop." But yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing moment. You. You know, you have this really, you know, obviously like super inspiring kind of health and wellness journey. And um, yeah, I just would love to know, like, you know, how do you use your whoop on a daily basis? Like, what does it inform for you? Well, most of the time it's, honey, leave me alone. I need to sleep more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so my biggest failure is in the sleep. But I travel. I do a lot of keynote speaking. Mm. I, I do leadership development. So I work with companies, which means I'm always on the road. And one mm. of the things that I 
didn't expect to get out of wearing my whoop, but have is it helps me understand when I've depleted myself and I've made myself vulnerable. So I know that I like about once every five to six weeks, I got to take a day and just chill. And, mm-hmm. and that's been, that's been true since I left my mother's house. Like every six mo- weeks I would take in a complete day and I'd eat nothing but popcorn and watch movies and I wouldn't leave the house. And, and the whoop is telling me why now I didn't, I did it, mm-hmm. but I didn't know why. And then mm-hmm. as, as high performers always do, you push through until you can't. So what ended up happening is about my birthday when, you know, you get the day off and everybody spoils you Christmas time, when you go back and see your family, summer vacation, when you're somewhere else, I got sick every single time. And it was my it's body the thing. Effect. Yeah. Yeah. So now I use my, <laughs> and I'm like, scientific term. look at me, my heart rate variables drop significantly. I'm probably really vulnerable for sickness. So maybe I'm going to drink a little more chai tea, do some low grade cardio instead of going out there and blasting my whole, doing a whole body workout. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a nap. I've started taking naps because the whoop has told me to. Um, every once in a while, I'll post on on threads or X or whatever all those social medias are now. Whoop is telling me to go outside. I'm going to agree with it. So, but yeah, so it does, it does lead to behaviors and it's not as many athletic behaviors as I thought it would drive as much as it's teaching me how to recover better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I love that you mentioned, you know, kind of those moments where you finally get to let down, you know, where you end up, you know, kind of getting sick and it it actually, there's a a actual scientific term, it's called the letdown effect. And it it usually comes during exactly the times that you described, you know, during weekends or vacations or holidays or, you know, big transitions, yeah. uh, like a move or a job change or retirement. And, and it's really kind of what's happening me- mechanistically is that kind of acute stress is going to impact your immune system. And then, and that's actually what, you know, obviously what's leading to the to illness. So, but I, th- I think I, I totally agree. I think whoop is so perfectly positioned to ensure that you don't ever get in that get in a position where you have that letdown effect, yes. you know, like you can kind of stay ahead of the letdown effect because yes. you want it when you're on a weekend, you know, a weekend or you're on vacation or a holiday, like you want to be able to enjoy it. Right. And, you know, you don't want to be sick. And, um, you know, I think people understanding that, Hey, we don't have to live a life where we're burning the candle at both ends, you know, in, in such a way that we get so run down that when we finally have a chance to relax, we actually get sick, Yeah, you know? And, and I think that's, that's, I think to your point, like, you know, I think that's a great use case for whoop, you know, yeah. to kind of help prevent those moments where you allow yourself to get really vulnerable, so vulnerable that you actually get sick. Yes. So yeah, that's really cool. Another interesting that. tie on to that is what stresses yeah. you out. And, and mm. I, so I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I absolutely love it. My training partners will actually look at my whoop data when we're done rolling and be like, ooh, mm. I pushed you the hardest. Like it's actually become kind of a funny thing because I've got the armbands, the sports bras, like I'm trying it off. Amazing. And um, good, good. So I did jujitsu in the morning and then I went to one of my son's wrestling tournaments and I noticed that my heart rate during his three one minute ma- or his three two minute matches mm. got as high or almost as high as my three five minutes where I was getting crushed by a human. And yeah. I had never calculated that into my personal stress. Been mm. like, oh, why am I so tired? I'm just, I'm just lazy. And no, it's, yeah. it's that stress of other things. It, it's so true. It's the same. My heart rate when my son is playing ice hockey, it, it's such, such a, you know, it's so fast paced. They're so good. It's, you know, but it's, there's just, it's pretty brutal, you know, and I'm just so scared he's going to get injured, you know, I, I, but, um, but it is funny. Like I, it, it's, it's like a, it's a workout for me yeah. just watching him play ice hockey. But let's talk about BJJ for a second. Cause I, I roll too. And that you know, makes me love you, you talk, that much more. Uh, oh, well, it, you know, it's funny. Cause I, I think, you know, people are like, why do you, you know, it's, why do you do it? And, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, having, it's just really hard, yeah. you know, and there's, you know, when someone's trying to like, break your arm or choke you, like, you know, and they weigh 50, 60, 70 more pounds than you do, like that is a position that you're not going to, hopefully you don't find yourself in real life. But I think when you can overcome that and survive it, 
can pretty much do anything you want for the rest of the day. Like nothing, like pretty much nothing's going to fix me. Right. Like I, you know, people talk about the cold water. I'm like, yeah, I do that for immune, but that is not hard. Like have a hundred, you know, a 200 pound like dude sitting on you trying to break your arm. Like then come talk to me. No, no, but um, not to to compete about, but I'm I'm just saying, you know, I, I think when you, when you talk about like doing hard things, so maybe let's just talk about doing hard things. Because I think there's a lot of value in doing hard things, right? And and things that like push you out of your comfort zone that, you know, require you to use parts of your brain that you wouldn't otherwise use, challenge you in ways that you wouldn't normally be challenged. And I think actively seeking those opportunities is an important part to, you know, vitality and renewal. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I can kind of go on and on about it, but I'd love to hear your perspective on the utility of just generally doing hard things, obviously a ranger cool school. But I think when you think about how do I abstract that down into my real life, right. you know, BJJ is probably a really good example of, of continuing that theme. Well, I'm going to use a, a, a totally different example, right? My husband owns a business. He's a, he owns a financial advising firm and they're going to go through something stressful. And he was talking about the way his business partners were reacting to it. And he said, you know, I don't know why I'm not getting as excited as they are. And I said, nobody's getting shot at. So we have these life experiences. He and I are dual military. And and so we literally said, okay, we make this decision. Somebody could die. Nothing we're going to, he's going to do in the financial advising world is going to result in the end of human life. And so when you get to that point where you've got a frame of reference, I think of my infant son, when I tried to cut his hair the first time and he screamed as if I was giving him stitches but I was just cutting some hair. He had no frame of reference. So if Mm. you don't do those hard things, and BJJ is such a great example, because not all of us can serve in the military. Not all of us can be law enforcement. God bless those men and women in uniform. Like not all of us can do those things. So how do you challenge yourself? This morning, this very morning, there's a group of four of us that got together at 6 a.m. and rolled because I couldn't roll. All of us had to work today. So from six to seven in the morning, we trained together and we had a very detailed discussion about the fact that our fight or flight was activated several times throughout that morning. And just like you said, I feel like I can deal with anything, but on the flip side, I know if somebody attacks me in the parking lot that I don't know that I can defend myself. I don't know that my jujitsu is enough to, to break contact and get safe. But I do know that I will physically be able to think through the attack, Mm -hmm. which is something Mm -hmm. I couldn't do before I tried to do something hard because I have that in my head. Well, if Ronnie, 225 pounds, can try to choke me, this guy choking me isn't different. He's got ill intent, Mm -hmm. but he's still going after my neck. So yeah, you know, and and there's lots of hard things. And most people are untrained, right, Lisa? Like, I I mean, we have a huge advantage because we're trained, yes. right? So, I mean, I feel pretty confident that if you come at me untrained, um, you know, it's not going to take me long to get you in a compromised position, Yes, you know, where I can yes, yeah, it, do damage. And, and I don't know, like my kids, until they start school sports, had to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. and wrestling. And, and I wish, and it's not a BJJ advertisement, but, you know, as an adult, as from what I've seen in the world... I loved my stand-up fighting styles, but I've never, ever seen anyone do a one, two, three, kick, punch, weave, punch, No, you're punch. on the ground. You're We're going to, as ground. a woman, you're going to be on your yes. back. Like, that's just the reality. And you need to be able to fight from your back. And you need to be able to think through that situation so that you you don't just get scared and freak up. Yeah. So, yeah, I think BJJ right. is is a great way. There's there's lots of other ways out there. Um I know it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people, but if you if there's any way you can get comfortable being uncomfortable, BJJ is the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you tap into like a really important point just around the autonomic nervous system, you know, and and I think modernity is kind of set up in a way where we don't we can avoid stress. Yeah. You know, I mean, we have a fridge full of food and, you know, we've got, there's like a lot of comforts, right? Mm-hmm. Like we've got temperature controlled homes. And so I think that's kind of a real thing that we, we actually need to induce, I think, some, some stress in order to improve 
our resilience. For sure. So yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of ways to do that, of course, you know, to to kind of create that hormonic stress. But yeah, I'm a obviously a huge fan of BJJ as a path as well. But I think you mentioned wrestling too. I mean, that's another, you know, so brutal. Uh, it's just a grind on so many levels. You know, I think if you can make it yeah. And and I love that it's now it's being offered to women. Actually, my alma mater, University of Iowa, uh, was one of the very first, you know, to to kind of create a, a wrestling program for for women. So really proud of that. But um, but yeah, wrestling is just this next level. Yeah. You know, just mentally being able to kind of get yourself in a position to endure ranger school, right? Like that's like a whole a whole nother level. But I, I guess I'm wondering, like, what did you learn from Ranger School in terms of like your mindset or mentality that you feel like has really translated into kind of your day to day life? I think I've readjusted my expectations for myself. Um, at Ranger School, they say things like, uh, "You're a strong Ranger or a smart Ranger." To graduate, you have to be both. Let, let's be honest. But when you look at, at even our armed forces in general, even if all you know about the military is what you've seen in the movies, is you kind of see there's the people that are pulling, pushing, lifting, running, carrying stuff. And then you see the surgeons and those support or the leadership who's doing the strategic planning and moving the puzzle pieces around the world. They're literally playing chess with humans and, and units and equipment. And so you have your thinkers and you have your physical people. I think what Ranger School did is it helped me be okay with the fact that, yes, I am I'm physically fit. Like I am, but that's not my greatest asset. So in, in the military, when you go in the field, you wear uh, a Kevlar, that's the, the brain bucket, that hard, hard piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And there is a spot for night vision goggles on the front of the helmet. In that spot... I have a placard that has my rank on it. And so I posted a picture online and somebody was making fun of me and said, oh, you're not an operator. And because of my experience in ranger school, I really was, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. If I'm out there and I'm the person engaging the enemy as an 05 in the United States Army, then who's doing my job? Because my job is between the ears. Being physical fit is awesome but that's not my job requirement. My job requirement is to be able to move those puzzle pieces and make sure the right assets are in the right locations at the right times. So I think it took me going through something really, really hard to release the fact that I want to be the biggest badass in the room. And I do, I still do, but I have to adjust and say, first, I have to do the things that only I can do. And so if you're, you know, taking it into corporate America, if you're the owner of the company and you work, I'm an engineer and you go out there and you swing hammers, it's really cool for you to help construct that building. Your guys will respect you for it. But if that's how you spend eight hours of your day, who's doing the designs? Who's doing the stress calculations? Who's making sure that the permits are submitted? No one. And so being respected by your guys is okay but more importantly is doing your job and accomplishing the mission. Mm, I love that. What advice would you give a young girl who is interested in signing up for ranger school? I would say whether you're signing up for ranger school or you want to be a stay-at-home mom, I will give you the exact same advice. Be Amazing. all in. Don't be, if you're going to be a stay at home mom, don't be one of these moms who has a cleaning lady. God bless those of you who can afford it and do it. But if you're going to stay home with the kids, don't have somebody else cook the food, have a nanny and have a cleaning lady, like take pride in whatever is in your domain. So I say it that way because a lot of people think that I don't respect, like, I don't think being the, the woman boss is the only route. I think being a woman is so much cooler than being a dude because I could be a stay-at-home mom or I could be a structural engineer. Either way, I'm okay with it. Guys, it's a little weird when they're the stay-at-home dad sometimes. Like hopefully society's getting better at that. We need to change that. Yes, we that's, do. We do. That's just the other side of the coin. Yes. That but I, I love that we can be yeah. either. 
So no matter yeah. what you're going to do, I'd say be all in. So let's say your daughter wants mm-hmm. to go to ranger school. Hey, when you go into ranger school, the best part about being all in is you have to shave your head. And the minute you shave your head as a woman, like all of us take pride in our hair. Even if we mm-hmm. aren't very cos- cosmetic savvy, we mm-hmm. still like, yeah, yeah, we still take pride in it. It's part of the identity. Yes, yeah. when you be, shave your you head, know. you are definitely all in. So they force you to do that. But I think when I say be all in, when I decided to go to ranger school, I wore a weight vest from the time I got home till the time I went to bed. And the reason why is my legs being an office cat, my legs hadn't, hadn't gotten used to, or had got, had become unused to being on my feet all day. So I wanted to be on my feet all day with that extra bit of weight. I wanted to make sure I'm not going to get shin splints for running all day for the first Mm -hmm. time. So, you know, your body needs to get used to it. So my way, when I say be all in, I'm saying wear that weight vest from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep, be okay with shaving your head, be okay with wearing boots, which aren't really pretty, but your feet have to get toughened up. So incorporate it into your entire life. And as somebody who was a reservist, so I did army part-time one week in a month. Mm-hmm. I had two kids. I had a good job at Shell where I was working a minimum of 60 hours a week. I was living in Houston. So I have two hours probably in the car every day. And that doesn't include my kids going to their practices, swim lessons, everything else they were doing. So, totally. you know, to train up for something like ranger school, it's not a, okay, minute, you know, hour 5 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. I'm training for ranger school. It's I'm awake. I'm training for ranger school, which means when I was walking my daughter to daycare, which was less than a mile away, she was on my back inside of a backpack. Or when I was going for a run, one of my kids was in a stroller. If I was bike riding, my kid was, or if I was running, my kid was bike riding next to me. You know, Mm -hmm. you have to, when you go all in, it means it has to become part of your life. You don't give up your life for your goals that that's not sustainable. And that also doesn't go back to what you were talking about. Like our future, you have to believe in our future. Part of that is including everyone else in your community into your values. So the people at my gym would change their workouts and we would do workouts that helped me get ready for ranger school. It Mm. didn't matter to them whether they were doing pull-ups or not, but I needed to do pull-ups. So every day we did pull-ups. And, you know, you so just cool. make it a community effort and really, and really be all in. There's nowhere else to say it, be all in. I love that. And then I think it, it comes down to, you know, then you need to think more clearly about what you say yes to. You know, if your framework is one where, hey, if I say yes, I am all in. Yes. And that totally, that's a difference. You know, I always think I, you know, I tell my kids, I'm like, don't tell me you're going to try. Like, <laughs> trying presupposes failure. Like, let's just be really clear. Yes. Like you're either going to do it or you're not going to do right. it. And, and if you say you're going to do it, you need to think clearly about what you're committing to and whether or not you want to make that commitment. And you're welcome to say no, but don't tell me you're going to do it. Yeah. You know, if you're going to do it, you better be all yeah. in. And I love that so much. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Lisa, what are you obsessing over right now? So, so we're going to go back to be being an advertisement for whoop. I am obsessing okay. over trying to get a decent night's sleep. So the oh. car is coming to pick me up for the airport at four o'clock tomorrow morning. Of course, my whoop is telling me I should go to bed in the next 20 minutes to get a full night sleep right. between now and Yeah, then. totally. It's totally. <laughs> but if I could get consistent sleep, so I'm, I'm about to turn 46. My body's changing, yeah. you know, not to get into too many intimate details, but I am definitely. Yeah. No, that's all right. We love those details. I, I am so definitely feel in free. the, yeah. the pre-menopause, menopause? Or peri- whatever mm. it's called. I'm on the far yeah, side, yeah. or I'm I'm starting down the slope. Okay. And so everything that worked for me for the last 45 years, literally mm. within like a two month period of time, completely stopped working. Like God, that's the, insane. The food I was eating, I was like, wait a minute. I, I've had the same five egg whites with one cup of steamed vegetables with a quarter cup of sharp cheddar cheese with Lowry seasoned salt and a waffle for breakfast every day for probably 10 years. And now Dang, it it's makes not me it. feel awful and bloated. So I eat the same thing, but I eat it for lunch. And it's mm. so, so what am I obsessing on? It's how do I maintain a high level of performance 
with one being okay with the fact that I'm, my body's completely changing and two, yeah. not letting it change excessively. Cause it's really easy to give up. So it, yeah. I, I have become a hawk on sleep. I mentioned her before we got on the call, but my, my friend, Allison Brager, uh, also your friend Mm -hmm. been on this podcast, but Mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's huge into sleep and the impacts of sleep. Mm -hmm. Ranger school definitely taught me that I could absolutely lose my mind and start uh, imagining things that when I don't sleep, right. So if I can fix my sleep and then I can figure out the proper nutrition, because I know how to work out, but also working out at 46 is not the same as working out at 26 either. Yeah. It's just the, I think the proportion of time you spend in cardio versus strength and, you know, I mean, you probably bias more to a lot of the strength type workout type workout anyway, you know, so (laughs) you're ahead of the curve in so many ways, Lisa. Yeah. So I can imagine like your symptoms are going to be a lot less egregious than someone who, you know, has never strength trained and isn't, you know, thinking about their nutrition in the way that you are or, you know, but yeah, I, Definitely will say obsessing over sleep is 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 the place to start. Yeah. Don't don't get anxious about the sleep. Well, it's so good to have you, Lisa. And just, you know, truly like I feel really grateful uh, to get to talk to folks like you who are just literally changing the world. And, you know, I think the impact that you've had on this generation and, and generations to follow you is is just uh yeah, it's it's gonna it's hard to quantify, but yeah, you've just been an absolute game changer. So thank you for everything that you've done. Well, thank you. I mean, what you're doing is huge. It impacts me every day, the research you work on. Uh, and uh, I think that's well, I fantastic. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. And folks can find you on on uh, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I know there's a lot of fake Lisa Jaster, Lisa Jasters out there. So you need to find the real one, the real Lisa Jaster. Yeah. <laughs> What's your handle? It's Lisa A. <laughs> we'll Jaster, sure all do. one word. Lisa A. Jaster. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, Lisa. It was so fun to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Kristen. Big thanks to Lisa Jaster for coming on the show to share her incredible story of determination and lessons on breaking barriers. Reminder, the holidays are coming up. And if you've got someone in your life who is obsessed with their health, fitness, tech, sleep, and always finding the ways to feel their best, Whoop makes the perfect gift. Check out whoop.com slash gifting to learn more. If you enjoyed this episode of the Whoop podcast, please leave a rating or review. Please subscribe to the Whoop podcast. You can check us out on social at Whoop at Will Ahmed. If you have a question you want to see answered on the podcast, email us podcastwhoop.com. Call us 508-443-4952. We'll answer your questions on a future episode. If you're thinking about joining Whoop, this is the best time ever because you can now sign up for free for 30 days. That's right, a free trial. It's the full membership experience and you can decide at the end of 30 days whether you want to become a member. New members can also use the code WILL to get a $60 credit on Whoop Accessories. That's just W-I-L-L at checkout. All right, folks, that's a wrap. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next week on the Whoop Podcast. As always, stay healthy and stay in the green.